Chip the glasses, crack the plates. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. So carefully, carefully with the plates. Blunt the knives and bend the forks. Smash the bottles, burn the corks. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. So carefully, carefully with the plates. Hello and welcome to WGTC Radio, the official podcast of entertainment website We Got This Covered. I am Jonathan Lack. And I am Sean Jevin. And we are here to talk about The Hobbit. Again. But not The Hobbit, an unexpected journey, coming out in theaters next week, December 14th. Also known as The Hobbit, terrible subtitle. Yes. Anyway, we are going to be talking today about The Hobbit, the 1977 animated film by Rankin Bass. Yes. Tell us about this movie, Sean. It is awesome. It, I think it is sort of, if you, you know, obviously with the uh, Peter Jackson's Hobbit films, they're kind of, since they're going in the other direction, I feel like they're going to make it a lot more Lords of, Lord of the Ringsy. you know, try to throw some more serious stuff in there. But if you want, like, a pure, this is a children's movie, this is The Hobbit in the style of The Hobbit book as an animated film, this movie is what you're looking for. It's really cheesy, it's kind of dumb, it's got a lot of really kind of lame songs that are really catchy and you kind of love because they're lame and catchy. It's just, it's, it's a really good children's movie. It and is. And I love it. Yeah, and so what we're going to do today is we're going to offer an audio commentary on The Hobbit. So you can sync this up with, you know, whatever copy of the movie you have. You can get it on iTunes, you can get it on some other digital services, you can get the DVD. It's out of print, but you can probably, you, you may have it if you yeah. like The Hobbit. So just find it some way, and you know, if you can't find the movie, you can probably just listen to the audio commentary if you want to hear what we have to say about it. Yeah. Um, because it's it's not going to be like we're going to be you know like calling back and forth with lines from the movie. Yeah. It's not going to be well, that. There might be some up. of that. Yeah. Little, that, that will be unavoidable, I feel. But. Absolutely. But you can listen to it. Anyway, we're saving the commentary for the end of the show. That'll be sort of the main portion. We're going to do it last because we know some people... A, probably won't want to hear the commentary, and B, may want to hear us talk about something non-Tolkien-esque for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, those people have been a bit disappointed for the last month who are not yeah. really interested in Tolkien. Because next week we're also going to be talking about The Hobbit. Next week we will be breaking down An Unexpected Journey. We'll be going in-depth talking about the whole movie. Um, and if, you're, if you want to hear about the movie before that, my review of the film will be up Thursday, December 13th at midnight. So it'll be like Wednesday at midnight, you can read my review and um, it'll be up, so lots to say about that. But we'll be talking about that movie next week. For now, we'll, be, we'll talk about The Hobbit uh, audio commentary later on. But first, what's going on in your life, Sean? Well, I recently got a little game that came out called Far Cry 3 that came out on Tuesday. It's a uh, really, really damn good game. And uh, it's kind of sad that it's come out this late, because I don't think it's going to necessarily get all the recognition it really deserves. But for those who don't know what Far Cry 3 is, it's... It's, it's the third game in the Far Cry series, but none of those games really have any sort of story tie to one another, which really makes it kind of weird, because I've played a little bit of Far Cry 1, and then I've played a lot of Far Cry 2, but was really disappointed by Far Cry 2, and it's kind of, like, they have a lot of really similar gameplay elements, but I don't feel like, because Far Cry 3 has such a distinct style and story and characters, it's, like, really fucking weird that it's still called Far Cry, because it has nothing to do with the other games. But it's a first-person shooter slash RPG, but it's a lot heavier on the shooter hybrids. The RPG's elements are sort of there to just gate abilities for you, so you're not necessarily this towering badass at the very beginning of the game. And it's kind of one of the most fun things about the game is that you start off as you're this guy, Jason Brody, who you're kind of this you know upper middder class, maybe pretty rich kid who he's this like white kid who's he's a daredevil. You know he goes skydiving and stuff like that, and he's with a bunch of his really like terrible yuppie friends that you're really supposed to hate because they're just terrible fucking people and they all skydive onto this island Rook Island and they run into a bunch of pirates that are fucking psychos and they capture you they capture your friends they kill your brother they've got you have two brothers they kill your older brother and you escape and you encounter this tribe called the Rocket who are the natives of this island and they turn you into this warrior this Rocket warrior and you have to go around saving your friends and that's sort of the premise of the game and it's got this really nice open world aspect to it where it's kind of like Skyrim or Red Dead Redemption where it's just really fun to be in the world and you're always like just kind of running around finding crazy stuff to do, setting bears on fire and running into pirate encampments and just, you know, deciding, you know, fuck it, I'm just going to set the whole world on fire right now because I've got 12 Molotov cocktails in my backpack and I've got nothing else to do. It's definitely that kind of game and what I really love about it is that it takes... 
it's sort of the opposite of Red Dead Redemption in some ways, where Red Dead Redemption was about John Marston as a man who he wants to get out of the life he's in, but he's being dragged back into the government and he has to take care of these bad people who he was in a gang with. But you feel that John Marston is really a good guy who's being forced to do bad things right now. And so when I play those kinds of games, I want to sort of role play as John Marston. I kind of want to feel like, you know, I'm not going to make the John Marston character do something that I wouldn't feel the John Marston character wouldn't do because that's I don't like to be immersed in games that way. So you don't like take the hookers and lasso them and like beat them to death and all that kind of no, stuff. No, I, I don't play Red Dead Redemption the way you play Red Dead Redemption. Oh, I love it. And Red I make sure to buy the bandolier as soon as I'm <laughs> capable of. But uh see previous podcasts for that discussion. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. But uh with Far Cry 3, it's really interesting because the narrative premise sort of goes in the other direction where you start off as Jason Brody who he's not necessarily like a great guy, but he's just sort of like a normal guy who's he's just kind of a prick because he's really out of touch with most people because he's really insanely rich and just an asshole. But he they has this opposite descent where he's you know he starts off as just a very really normal dude, but he's in these very extreme circumstances, and he slowly starts turning into this sort of this sociopath. There's a lot of really interesting discussions he has with some of the other some of his friends that he saves, where they start recognizing the direction he's going in. And he has these very interesting conversations where he talks about where he feels at first he was really afraid of killing people, but now killing feels like winning. It has this, like, this really interesting psychology behind the main character that you play as, which is really fascinating for a first-person shooter, because it's generally first-person shooter main characters are just like Gordon Freeman. He's just this guy who's this shell for you to occupy, but Jason Brody is very much a character, and since he very quickly turns into a homicidal sociopath, that allows me to feel okay to be a homicidal sociopath, so I don't feel bad when I do things like hunt bears with cargo trucks or just <laughs> stab people who are not people who necessarily deserve to be stabbed. The game told me to do it. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, Jason Brody's fucking crazy. And, you know, I, I said stab people who don't necessarily deserve to be stabbed. Fuck that. Everything on that island deserves to be stabbed and set on fire. Everything. This is actually kind of the great thing about the game. Everything on that island fights and kills everything else on that island. There's you, there's the Rock Yacht Tribe who are mostly on your side, but, you know, sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes you hit the e-brake a little bit too late and you crush the dude onto your truck and his friend wants to kill you. You know, that happens sometimes. So the Rock Yacht Tribe will attack you if you attack them. Then you have the pirates who are always antagonistic. And then you just have, like, you know, crocodiles that will start just attacking people and tigers that will start attacking people and, like, crazy ostrich things. I don't know, know what they're called. They'll start attacking people. There are bears. There are leopards. There are fucking boars. Just everything tries to kill each other on the island. So you run into crazy situations like... Okay, one of the things... The most fun part about the game is not necessarily doing the story missions, even though a lot of the story stuff is done very well. I haven't beaten the game, so I can't give, like, my full sort of like spoilers impressions but the, some of the character work is really interesting so you do like doing the story missions and sort of see where that stuff goes but the heart of the game is when you're on the island you have to sort of go around and there are these enemy outposts that you have to clear and those give you access to uh new stores so that you can buy new ammo and weapons and it gives you access to uh you know you get some collectibles and stuff like that and so th- and it also will clear out the enemy, the area of enemies, so you can pass through that area safely, and that's kind of key. Because if you don't do that for some areas, you'll get fucked on missions, because it'll just be pirates all over the place. So you want to clear out these outposts, and you can... And the interesting thing about the outposts is you can sort of tackle them from any direction. You can... It's very this sort of, like, freeform thing where you can, you know, you can just go in guns blazing if you want to, but the smarter way to do it generally tends to be you sneak in there... And you try to, you know, you disable the alarms, you try to take guys out without other guys noticing using melee takedowns or silence weapons or your compound bow. That's a lot of fun to use. And that's the best part of the game, is trying to take out the outposts. And one time, there's actually, I have so many stories about these outposts, but one of the outposts was I was just sort of like creeping up. You sort of want to stay around the perimeter of these outposts using your camera that allows you to tag enemies so you know where they are. They sort of like pop up on your screen and you can see their outlines through objects. And that's really key to being able to infiltrate the places. So I was just kind of doing that around the perimeter, scanning guys, trying to figure out what way I wanted to tackle this thing, because I tend to want to do it stealthily. And then all of a sudden I hear this growl from behind me. I'm like, what the fuck was that? And I turn around, there's a tiger right fucking there. And so I'm like, oh shit. And I fucking book it. And then I turn around and I see slowly, like, the, the, all the guys that attacked in the camp slowly started, I saw their silhouettes getting knocked to the ground and dying. I'm like, did that... Did that 
Tiger just going to the camp? Is that Tiger just killing everybody? So then I ran up and I watched and the Tiger was just going around killing motherfuckers. And so I was like, well, this is fucking perfect. And I just snuck in there. Eventually they killed the Tiger and then I set the last two guys on fire with a Molotov cocktail. This problem solved, you know. This very helpful Tiger. Sometimes the Tigers are not so helpful. Nothing, nothing cleaner than Tigers taking out all your enemies. Yeah, exactly. There's also, in, in you have mines in C4 that you can set around. That's a, that's a ton of fun to just chuck, like, three packets of C4 into an area and just be like, I'm just going to blow this whole place up. That's stealthy, right? If everybody dies in the same instant because of giant C4 explosions, you're technically undetected, so you get the XP bonus. It's, there's nice. a lot of really, really fun moments like that in that game, and I really... I think it's one of the most fun games I've I've had the most fun playing this game I think of any game I've played this year it's you know it's not necessarily really deep it might be because it it could go in a lot of interesting places I don't think it necessarily will but it definitely if you're just looking to have a lot of fun this is that game of this year this is like the Red Dead Redemption of this year where it's like I can just play this game and have a shit ton of fun just being in the world they've created. So, well, I, I definitely want to play it after hearing about this. It sounds yeah. like a game I would like. Yeah, Even no, though definitely. I'm terrible at stealth usually in games. Maybe this game encourages you better than others. I, I think it does. I think and there's a lot of different ways you can be stealthy, and it's so much fun. Because I'm, I'm with you, too. I tend not to like stealth in games like this, but there's something about the, uh, the, like the knife takedowns and being able to see their silhouette through walls that makes it... It's not necessarily really easy... But you don't feel like it's ever cheap. Like you feel like there's always a way to do this in a really smart way, and you want to figure that way out. And this sounds good. Yeah, it's yeah. a hell of a game. I definitely encourage people picking it up if you haven't and are interested in that kind of thing. Yes. So, and he, as you just noted, you know, because it's coming out near the end of the year, people are probably not putting it on top ten lists and stuff as well. Yeah, much. a lot of websites are already putting out there like these are going to be the game of the year contenders and Far Cry yeah. 3 is not on a lot of them, disappointingly because That's too bad. Not a lot of people have have, have have had opportunity to play it yet. Right. Well speaking of all that, I, I just finished a week where I saw six films, I think, something something crazy. That that's maybe with some screeners I got on DVD. But I've been watching a ton of movies. I've pretty much seen everything in 2012 can't name certain specific titles, but mm-hmm. I'm I'm pretty much done for the year. Got a one or two more DVDs at home that I've been sent that I need to watch. But other than that, I've seen the year films of 2012. I'm drafting my top ten list, and it's you know it's an exciting time. That's one of my favorite things of the year is making my top ten list. So that will be coming out on We Got This Covered very soon, either within this week or early next week. But we're aiming for this week. There's some embargo issues. My one of my top films of the year is not out yet, and that's a problem. In fact, multiple ones are not out yet, so we've got to clear some stuff. But other yeah. than that, we um, it's a it's exciting time. Lots of good movies coming out this month. I just got to tell you the one I can tell you about because the embargo is lifted and my review is on. We got this covered right now. It's at the top of the page, you can read it. Is Zero Dark Thirty? This is Catherine Bigelow's new film, uh, written by Mark Bull. This is the same team that did The Hurt Locker in two thousand nine which everyone loves. It's a great movie. Yeah. And Zero Dark Thirty is probably even better. I think some people will be more alienated by it because it does not have the same sort of character focus The Hurt Locker did. And I maybe prefer The Hurt Locker just on my own because it's it does, to me, have more characterization to it That's because yeah. that's what it's about, is yeah. these people. And Zero Dark Thirty is very much more process-oriented. But as The Hurt Locker was all about... Or, or stylistically, I should say, it was all about sort of journalistic ethics and that it was, you know, very much everything was realistic, it was grounded, it was very much about the process that these soldiers go through and the bomb diffusing and all these other things in Iraq, and it sort of was presented without commentary or slant or bias or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Well, Zero Dark Thirty goes even further into that direction, and it is all about the hunt for Osama bin Laden on the CIA side. And when I say it's about that, that's all it's about. That's the entire movie beginning to end is sort of you, it focuses around this main character, Maya, played by Jessica Chastain, who's based on a real CIA analyst who was crucial in finding the courier who led them to the Osama Bin Laden compound. And, but, so, so sort of that's the only sort of dramatizing that goes on is, I mean, there's a lot of dramatizing, obviously, as a movie, but that's sort of like they focused it around this character, but otherwise it's all about step by step, process, process, process procedural elements, you know, how do they get from, you know, 2001, the terrorist attacks, to 2011, taking down Bin Laden, and I think if you're interested in any of that, it's a phenomenally fascinating film, and really, really good, and it comes out December 21st in 
New York and L.A. and maybe another couple cities. It does not come out like here in Denver until January 11th. So uh, maybe a little bit of a wait to see that one, but it's definitely worth it. And the crazy thing about my top ten list is I said in my review of Zero Dark Thirty that it is as smart and well-made a drama as I've seen all year, and it probably will not be on my top ten this year. There have been so many good movies. Uh, it's just crazy. So... It's going to be interesting. And I think the week after we talk about The Hobbit, so next week we're going to talk about The Hobbit, uh, either the week after that or maybe in that show, if it's come out already, we will do a year-end, and I'll do my top ten on this podcast also. So, And I know Sean has seen at least two of the movies on there. Yes. So yes. maybe maybe three? I have to look at it. But in any case, so some good stuff coming out. I don't think there's any other movies I can tell you about yet because either I haven't published my review yet or they're embargoed, but a lot of good stuff. Yep. So I, I just watched. I just watched my screener. I got sent of Silver Linings Playbook again because I loved that movie when it came out last month, and I just kind of wanted to confirm where it's going to be on my list. Not to spoil anything, it's hypothetically on the list, and it's that's a great movie. If you have not seen Silver Linings Playbook, go see it and like take your family and, and like just just people you like seeing movies with because it's a damn good movie and it's a crowd pleaser that deals with like, complex emotions, and I don't know if I've ever seen a movie quite like that. That's, like, a sort of arousing, everyone can enjoy a crowd pleaser, but it deals with, like, psychological damage. So hmm, Interesting. Yeah, really good movie. That's Bradley Cooper and Jennifer Lawrence and David O. Russell directing. So, anything else, sort of, to talk about before we get into our commentary or some other stuff? Not really. Not just, really? There's just been a whole lot of Far Cry 3. Nice. Yep. All right, well, we're going to go off and record this commentary. You won't hear the gap, but there will be a commentary here, so... Bear with us. If you want to hear the commentary, keep listening. We'll tell you how to sync it up. We'll tell you everything you need to know, and then we'll talk about The Hobbit. Yes. Okay, so here is how this commentary here is going to work. We've got the DVD set up right now. We are about to hit play. We'll, we'll like count to three and hit play, and then we'll let the sound on the TV go for a little bit, and you can use it sort of to sync your systems, and then we'll start talking about this movie. Yes. All right, count to three. One, two, three, play. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Okay, Sean, so we are talking about the Hobbit movie. Yes. So we're starting with a book, as, as we probably should. Yes. And in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. But then it goes into something very different. He's talking about, like, in ancient times, and this. Yes. He comes to so funny. ancient a word. Yes. So... This is Orson Bean narrating, if I'm not mistaken, is it? Uh, I'm not entirely okay. sure. It sounds like Leonard Nimoy, though. Yeah, it does. Funny. It does yeah. sound like Leonard Nimoy. So let's talk about the animation here. I can't decide if it's good or kind of unwatchably terrible. I think I really like the design of everything. I think all the backgrounds look really, really good. But I think the actual animation of the characters is not so great. Like, if you watch the, like the plate, like, look at the fucking plate compared to everything else. It looks... Awful. Yeah. It's very obviously not nearly as detailed, but I think the background stuff looks awesome. Yeah, it's an interesting sort of storybook style. Yeah. And there's Gandalf, just for yeah, some Ninja nowhere. Gandalf, <laughs> just sort of like face shifts into existence. Yes. They definitely make Gandalf much more of like a blatantly magical than I would in a right. Lord of the Rings Hobbit adaptation because it's always sort of more ambiguous how much magic he really uses. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't, Gandalf definitely doesn't just use magic for the hell of it. Yeah, he doesn't just sort of appear out of thin air. It no. may seem like it, but it's because he's sneaking but, the fuck And here he's just scaring Bilbo yeah. into submission, just gonna summon Ooh, some lightning. Oh, I, he actually, he summons the weather element several times in this film. Yeah. Which is a little odd. Yeah. <laughs> he's, you know, he's Gandalf, master of storms. Yes. So he's basically one of the X-Men. Yeah, no, he's he's Storm. He's yeah. actually just Storm from the X Men. He don't, you can't tell that Gandalf's a female, but yeah, she, she's just Storm. Yes. All right, so here are dwarves singing the song. Yep, this is sort of the the whole style of it is it's it, it's really interesting the pacing and how they use the songs where it's basically a musical, but most of the character other than like the song coming up, most of the characters don't actually sing the songs. But there's generally a song playing for most of the... Like, a lyrical song playing for most of the film. Yeah, it's an odd style. Yeah, but I think it gives it this very interesting sort of, like, poetic pace. Yeah. 
No, it, it helps because the movie, as you're seeing right now, moves at a breakneck speed. I mean, we're already... Yeah. All the dwarves have come. They're doing... They're, but here's the song. We have to talk about this. Yeah. It's an awesome song. We opened our podcast with this today. It's fun. Yeah. No, it's, it's just... What I love about this song is that it's not like most of the other songs. Actually, okay, a lot of the songs are improvised. But this one in particular, it's like all the dwarves just come in like... Fuck it. We're just, we just made up a song about us fucking around with Bilbo. Yep. I just love that they can just come up with that on the spot. Here's the interesting thing about Gandalf's design that you're seeing right here. Is that the lines of his beard go into the lines of his face. Yeah. And they do that the whole movie. You'd think it was a mistake, but that's a deliberate design choice. Yeah. Oh, no, he's just like... Gandalf's face and his beard are one. There's like There is no spot where the beard begins and the face ends, you know? It's very true. It's like he can't shave off the beard. <laughs> it's part of him. All right, I love that they're all playing instruments, but none of those instruments are heard on the soundtrack. Yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's just silhouette. They weren't playing the instruments. They were just, like, like short, like taking a harp and just moving it back and forth. Ah, it's, a, it's a dwarven thing. Yeah, that's just kind of what they do. Yep. Just once. All right, so here's Thorin. Yep. All the dwarves look really fucking old, except for Dory. The yeah. Dory. Or, no, it's Feely and Keely. They don't look yeah, Feely and Keely are the young ones. Yes, I do prefer that. <laughs> so, I love that Bilbo kind of rolls over and takes everything in this movie. He's Yeah, Bilbo feels really, other than like a few sections, he feels really detached from yeah. everything. It's just like, eh, okay, whatever. I'll, I guess I'll go along with you guys. Yeah. It's an odd line to walk because that's sort of the challenge of The Hobbit is that he has nothing to do with the dwarves and their and the, sort of the mythology of this story. Yeah. But Tolkien does a pretty good job of, of showing everything, all his thought process to, like, doing this adventure. Yeah. Uh, this movie is not as much interested in that. Yeah, and when you, since, it's, you know, it's a movie, you're not going to be have that, like, perspective. When he's divorced from his thought process, it's just like... Bill looks a lot of times just feels like a chill, laid back dude. Yeah. Just sort of like, yeah, fuck it, I'll, I'll play a riddle game. Whatever. Sounds like fun. Alright, so here we have the big flashback to show sort of yeah. the mythology of this story. And it's odd because sort of Thorin starts narrating, and then now we're going to have the narrator of the movie, who's also Gandalf, is going to yeah. tell it, but mostly in poem. Yeah, he's, he's like now just reciting the, like, the poem that, the song that all the dwarves sing at the, from the very beginning with, like, We Must Away or Break the Day. That song is just like, that's a really long fucking song in the book, and they're just basically saying it right here. Which is nice, because if they were singing it, we, that would be the whole movie. We'd be here forever, yeah. Yeah. Doubtless they carve hair for themselves. of gold. This is kind of, this is one of my favorite parts of the movie. I just like the, like, the, I think the music is the real star of this movie to me, where it's like, it really captures this atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, there is some nice design here on all their yeah. like gold and their swords and their jewels. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, a lot of thought goes into a lot of the design. I feel. Yeah. Now I don't quite know why they're in a wagon in this part. Yeah, I don't know. It's like all this. Uh, like the whole flashback sequence is kind of weird. I don't know. Yeah. Now, now he's getting into the main poem. Yes. Fire was red, at flaming spread. Ponies are fucking scared, as they probably should be. They're gonna get burned to shit. And there's Smaug. Yep. In the background, you can't quite see him very well yet. They pronounce it Smog in this movie. The correct pronunciation is Smaug. I have learned. The men are very surprised in their sort of monochromatic way. I love how the water moves. Like, you could only see it a little bit there with the river, but there's later where they show, like, a waterfall. And it's like, there's something, it almost feels like, the, yeah, like that waterfall. It feels like it's almost, uh, like, the backgrounds in Flintstones, where it's, like, yeah. the same pattern that just keeps on repeating over and over and over again. That's basically it. Yeah. There, there's sort of this weird dreamlike quality to this part of the movie that works yeah. pretty well setting up the... Story. Yeah. And now we're back. Yes. <laughs> and now women. I don't think there are any women in this movie. Yeah, no. It's very faithful to the book. Yes. <laughs> in that way. 
J.R.R. Tolkien, interesting fact, did not know that women existed until he started writing Lord of the Rings, and that's when he started ah. producing female characters in his works. Interesting. Interesting. I yep. did not know that. I've always liked this weird, like, in comparison to Lord of the Rings, this weird, like, sort of superstition around the number 13 feels very, like, our world-ish. Yeah. I don't necessarily would expect Middle Earth to have that superstition. So, yeah, it's, it is funny how much of Bilbo's role in the story is just motivated motivated by they want 14 people, not yeah. 13. And I'm also, I don't know what culture holds 14 as a lucky number. 14 seems like a really weird lucky number. Ten not to... Well, it's not 13. Yeah, I guess. But they say it like 14. No, that's, a, that's a lucky number. I also like how they do, they write up that, like, really brief contract that's yes. like three sentences. It's like... If you die, you'll probably die, but if you don't, you'll get some money. That's yeah. like that's their contract. <laughs> sure. And now we've gone through all that and we're just at the opening credits, so yeah, this movie's no. booking. I I do love that it goes for like the late credit start. It yeah. does I don't know. Alright, so here touch. look at his fingers here. Look at his fingers, because they draw fingers really weird in this movie. There's a ton of lines yeah. and they look like sort of old and bony, like all of, like everything in this movie looks like it's really old. All yeah. the I mean, especially the like the noses on the doors for some reason they're like long pointed and they've got all the like detail lines on them. Yeah, it's like someone really just kind of went to town. So based on the original version of the Hobbit, I what does that mean? Because it's not if they're meaning like yeah. because if there's a whole history where Tolkien revised the Hobbit out when he was writing Lord of the Rings, so Gollum yeah. was more of an adversary. Mm-hmm. But they present it via the second edition in this movie. It's yeah. still Gollum as adversary. So I don't know what they mean by based on the original version of the Hobbit. I don't know. I, I don't know either. Maybe it might be some sort of like weird legal thing or something. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's too bad. Like okay, so here we have Bilbo. Pretend, you know, thinking he's the king under the mountain is his yeah. dream. It's too bad they didn't actually do that in the movie at the end. Like, <laughs> yeah, they just dies. decided, it's like, yeah, no, we'll change the ending. Yeah. It's it's just there now. It's just there, and I'm the fucking king. Yes. Deal with it. Theodore. <laughs> yeah, the best credit, it's just Theodore. <laughs> I'd love to know who that is. Yeah. So, Bilbo's feet, I should note, the hair on his feet is really weird design where it's just like a mat, like a shag rug. Yeah, yeah, no, it's just, I mean, it's basically like it's an outline and then his feet are just colored differently on the top. It's yeah. all this different. It's very, very weird. What do you think of this song that, that comes back a lot, The Greatest Adventure? I, I really like The Greatest Adventure and I like Road Goes Ever On. I okay. think those are two, you know, it's not like songs I listen to all the time, but... They did a good job they, with them. Yeah, they've got, they've got this nice spirit to them. That really fits Romeo the Muller is the screenwriter on this film. It's kind of an interesting name. Yeah, just thought I'd point that out. It is an interesting name, Romeo Muller. All right, I'd hate to be named Romeo. Think of all the Shakespeare jokes that I know we've made about you. It'd be awful. Like you'd, you'd have. To, I think you'd have to once you like. If you were named Romeo and you became aware of Shakespeare at some point in your life, you'd realize I'm gonna have to kill myself one day. That's just that's <laughs> yeah. how my life's gonna end. It doesn't have to end soon. It's just someday. Yeah, and every time I say something, this is something everyone's just like, "Oh, really, Romeo? Romeo?" Romeo. Right. No one would be able to say that name seriously. Back to the Hobbit. <laughs> uh, that was all about the Hobbit. He is, he is a wizard, you know. That means he can summon lightning. <laughs> this whole this part of the movie is kind of weird, where they're just like, we're going to have two lines of dialogue, then we're going to cut, have another scene with two lines of dialogue. We're just and Gandalf gives him some weird advice here, where Gandalf's like, just... Think of good things when you're sad. Gandalf's really a fortune cookie through a lot of this movie. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of weird because I'm so attached to Gandalf in his extended role in Lord of the Rings. It's always kind of weird how sparse he is in The Hobbit, and especially in this movie, too, because this movie cuts out a lot of stuff. Yeah. So Gandalf's just kind of this weird guy who follows with them sometimes and sometimes yeah. not. Just like, you should do stuff. Bye. <laughs> when he leaves. Here are the trolls, and they frame it in a weird way in this movie, where I feel kind of bad for the trolls, because they're just minding their own business, eating some food, and yeah, the, the hobbit and the, the dwarves are just like, oh, let's go fuck with some dwarves. Yeah, and it's just like, ah, oh, then we're gonna get them killed and steal all their stuff. Yeah. Again, love the word burgle. Yeah, it's a great word. It needs to come back in, like, modern diction. Yes. <laughs> I like I like the one troll that has tusks in the eye patch. Yes, <laughs> like, I don't know why only one of the trolls has tusks. And they drew the eye patch really poorly because sometimes it looks like he's missing the eye, and that's like the hole. Yeah. And sometimes you can tell it's actually an eye patch. Yeah, it's a weird lighting thing. Mm-hmm. Right, so 
there's bad off as a there, Bilbo is a total fucking pussy here. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the first time he's encountered anything sort of strange. It's true. Still, that's just like I wonder if all the other trolls are racist towards the trolls with tusks, like because of the <laughs> nuts, they're a very rare type of troll. I, I want to know the tusky trolls backstory. That'd be interesting. That maybe in Peter Jackson's Hobbit, they're doing three movies. They can. <laughs> they really, That's the character that you to expand out. Yeah, so we could flesh out a lot of the dwarves. But, ah, Tusky Troll. <laughs> that's the guy we want to know about. All right, so Bilbo just got thrown aside. Yeah, the trolls. The size of the trolls is interesting because at first they just look kind of big, and then they yeah. But bigger. then when you see them next to the trees, they seem like they're Godzilla size. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but now they're just normal again. Yep. So here's a part, they're about to just cut out a giant swath of the story. Yeah, like, in a really good part. Yeah. And it makes no goddamn sense. Yeah. So apparently the trolls are just really careless, as we're about to see, because they just decided they were going to laugh until Gandalf arrives, and there we go. Here he is. I do like that effect where Gandalf is like a tree and then he becomes not a tree. I don't know why they did it, but... So there's a big question here is were the trolls just lazy or did Gandalf manipulate the sun into coming out? Yeah. That is, is Gandalf a superhero who can just turn this like rotation yeah, of the it, earth it, faster? It, it's because, you know, obviously in the original version of the story, Gandalf tricks them using like his voice to make them argue amongst themselves until the sun comes up. Here it's just like Yeah, either the trolls are just idiots and they forgot that the sun turns into stone for a while, or Gandalf should just be able to just kill Smaug by crushing him with the fucking sun, apparently. Yes. And then they find a cave, and Bilbo's really proud of himself for finding it, when really all he did was kind of turn his head. Yeah, there was. he basically just got thrown in there. Uh, yeah. So... <laughs> yes, they don't seem like troll blades to him, because... He, they're not. They're, yeah, they're not huge... <laughs> Pretty yeah. obviously not troll blades. I, I like that Bilbo doesn't know what runes are. Yeah, it, this is that's a really weird detail because he's you know a guy who's so obsessed with maps would probably have encountered runes at some point. Yes, yes. we've got them now. Thorin, <laughs> yeah, Thorin's kind of an asshole in this movie. He is like, yeah, they're our source now. He's kind of an idiot too. He's kind of reckless. Yeah. All right, their depiction of Sting is they basically are like, how can we make Sting really lame? There's something about Sting that kind of reminds me of the way the uh, the Sword of Omens from Thundercats. I don't know if you ever watched Thundercats. It does, because it got that yeah, curve. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's that thing. I don't know. It's weird. I, I keep on expecting him to go like, Thundercats, 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 ho, oh, and then the sword gets really long. He never does that in the movie, though. It's kind of disappointing. Yeah, it's very disappointing. Yeah, they should remake it. So now Gandalf is going to give him the map. And it's <laughs> this is a weird change. It's because it, it, I I see why they didn't want to do it earlier. It's a lot of exposition. Yeah. But they just it's the weirdest spot where Gandalf's just like, oh, I guess I forgot. Here's a map. Yeah, there's a lot of really weird things like that in this movie that, like, for someone like us, kind of just like, why the fuck would you put that there? But I think when you're a kid, it's so, there's something weird about that pacing where I can see from the perspective of like you know someone who's like six years old, that pacing totally makes sense. Oh yeah, that's like that's that's where you put the map thing. You just keep it. It kind of just keeps the ball rolling. Yeah, something's always happening in this movie. Yeah, they're just constantly revealing a little plot detail where it's a lot more front loaded in the book. And Bilbo. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, right here, Bilbo figures out that that hand means there's a secret door. Yeah. Well, I don't know how the fuck he figures that out. Yeah, but. he he says there's something about this hand and the runes, but there are no runes there. You can very clearly see. Yeah. So that that went past someone in a weird way. Yes. Someone apparently just forgot to draw those little details on the map when they were making yes. the movie. It's too small for how do they know so much about the fucking secret passageway? Yeah, it's a very but weird... Not, but not where it is. Like, yeah. they, now they need the moon letters to find out exactly where it is, but they know everything else about the secret passage. Yeah, just because there was a hand there. Yeah. Like, hands, hands mean a lot. But then, Bilbo had to figure that all out, but Gandalf had to know the whole time because he had the fucking key, which he just kept concealed. Yeah. <laughs> also, like, he just kept the key in his sleeve, too. Yeah. It's just, like, he's had to keep his arm horizontal the entire time so it didn't slip out. <laughs> This is a really awkward part of the story you didn't get to see. Yep, so now we got some more vibrato voice singing. Yep. 
some more landscapes, which look pretty nice. Yep, I think they realized they were really, like, they had some guy working on the backgrounds that was really fucking good, and they're just, they're just gonna put a bunch of those in. Yeah. On there, you just saw Rivendell, which is a log cabin. Yep. That's it. And a funny thing here is, if you listen to what Bilbo's about to say, Bilbo is basically about to just start quoting text from the book, but not dialogue. He's just gonna, like, what J.R. told me to write about the elves. Like, yeah, elvish singing is something not to be missed. And yeah. Stars... It's just all just from the Tolkien book. <laughs> but now we get the tra la la song, Yeah, we get the, fun. the Elvish song. Yep. Although it's, like, not... This, you know, most of the musical numbers are the songs from the books, but they're not sung... Like, in the book, it, this, this song's actually sung by elves as the dwarves are going into Rivendell. Yes. And I kind of wish they had drawn that, like, just a bunch of elves shouting at the dwarves making fun of them for the song. It's a great moment in the book, too, because the d- elves are kind of... J- Yeah, they're just assholes. They're just making fun of them for no reason. Here's Elrond, who uh, has some accessories. (laughs) Yeah, the the design of Elrond's uh, weird, to say the least. Yeah, he said this like crown, but it's like that like cool like high collar cloak thing. It looks like Doctor Strange from comic books. Yeah, I, I want to see Hugo Weaving in The Hobbit. Yeah, act like that like, and have that like CGI the weird floating crown thing on him. Yep. The goblin cleaver. So this bugs me that they call it Orchrist the Goblin Cleaver because Orchrist means Goblin Cleaver in Elvish. Because, you know, Orc means Goblin in Elvish. That's Orcs and Goblins are the same, same thing, guys. And then they do the same thing with the other one. Yeah, no, they do it with Glandring also. Glandring just means Foe Hammer. Well, it's, gla- it's not called Glandring the Foe Hammer. I don't know why that bugs me that much, but it does. Well, it's, a, it's just an odd detail to change that, you know, yeah. you, 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 assuming... You have the time to make a whole movie about this, you'd probably think about that. Yeah. So, kind of odd. Ah, the moon letters. <laughs> I always thought the moon letters were, it had to be a full moon or something. I don't remember. It is, in the book, yeah. it's like... Because they just showed the moon, and it was not a full moon, so... Again, it's sort of a weird thing if you knew the book well enough to make a movie. Yeah, it just seems like it's a weird little detail you'd remember to throw in there. But yes. Oh, uh, we got some thunder and lightning. Yeah, I love that transition. Like, it, like the it shining upon the keyhole is really goddamn ominous, apparently, that it warrants this thunderbolt. <laughs> Which doesn't exactly pay off in this movie, because it's just kind of, when they get to that point, it just it happens. Yeah, they're just sitting around, it's like, oh, hey, yeah, this, this is a thrush, there's light, keyhole. Alright, so they're in the cave. Yep. I like that Thorin has to give an inspirational speech about how they found the perfect place to camp. <laughs> we found the perfect place to camp. And here we have a weird... Where Bilbo's dreaming, <laughs> and this is like this weird... Gre- it feels like he's going insane. Like, yes. this made him so pissed off. It's like, in his subconscious, <laughs> he wants to start killing the doors or something. So he wakes up and goes on a killing spree? Yeah, like, I don't know why that green filter is all during the weird random dream sequence. I wish I was a wizard. And Bilbo wishes he was a wizard. I, I'm surprised That's the password to, a- to open the secret door. Ooh, yes. Oh. I was just saying to do a dream sequence where he like imagines himself as a wizard. He's got a big beard that grows into his face. Yes. So here's an, an all interesting change from the book is that they decide to just chase after the goblins and then get themselves kind of fucked. Yeah. In the book, they're all they, the goblins come in and kidnap yeah, them all while they're sleeping. Yeah. So. Get the and, goblin song. Oh, the goblin song is great. It feels like it wants to go into just full blown rock and roll, like grunge rock. Yeah, yeah, I, it definitely does. But it's pretty cool. I like it. And yeah, I like the song too. We're about to see the goblins for the first time in their design, and it's very different than. It's, re- it's not what you'd expect. They've got, like, big. T- every, every monster in this movie has really huge, like, teeth that poke up out of their jowls. Which would be very uncomfortable. Yeah. They've got, like, weird sort of horns, and they're really big and fat. Yeah. Where you always, I always think of goblins as being sort of like small lithe creatures and not these like big hulking monstrosities. But they've even got capes, of which I like, and yeah. they have patches of hair and like these these they're sort of like yaks. They've got horns. They yeah, they've got the those weird horns and stuff. Yeah. It's odd. But they're going down to Goblin Town. Yeah. Oh, oh my man. <laughs> I love that part. And now we have the weird fire interlude. Yeah, the fire transition. And now the Goblin King. Thorin, in the book, Thorin's, you know, trying. he's very rude to the goblins because he doesn't like them. Yeah. Here he's like, oh, could just help us out. Yeah, come on, man. I didn't mean to come here. To explain his weapon. This sword is named Orcris 
Just it's just orcs. Ah, God damn it! Goblins don't get it. Yeah. But you know, at least the goblins maybe they don't know Elvish. Yeah. Elrond yeah. should have fucking known better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's the one who translates the name for them. I like how he's just gonna eat him. He's just like, yeah. you know, bite your fucking head off. My favorite thing about the Goblin King's design is instead of having the yak horns, he's got like this little tiny unicorn horn in his forehead. Unicorn goblin. Yep. And here Gandalf makes it's like one of his mysterious appearances. I'm just Glamdring or Foe Hammer. You can call one, one of the two. Pick yes. one. Yeah. <laughs> Glamdring. The Glamdring. <laughs> I love the weird effects that they always do when they kill people in this movie because it's a kill kids movie, so they don't want like you know him just like cut the Goblin King in half. So instead, he like gets turned into a ghost and sent to the Phantom Zone or something. Pretty much. Yeah. It's it's like the Shadow Realm from the Yu-Gi-Oh dub. Yeah. It's it's just this weird effect to show that people have been killed. Alright, I love this. Bilbo just gets bonked on the head. Yeah, he rolls just, down really slowly. And then he gets cast into like a deep, endless chasm. <laughs> it's sort of like slowly spinning. Somehow lives. We don't yeah. know. Maybe maybe there's water at the He's gone! Cut to commercial break. Yes, because this was aired on TV originally. Yes. Alright, so Balin's looking. Apparently he doesn't notice the giant gaping chasm, chasm into deep blackness right in front of him. Bilbo rolled quite a ways. Yeah. Once he got down into the chasm. But now we're going to meet their version of Gollum. What do you think of this Gollum, Sean? I, I really like this version of Gollum. I like I like his design. Like this, this might just be because I've watched the movie a lot when I was a kid. But this feels like what Hobbit version of Gollum is like. He's kind of a lot more amphibious. Yeah. I always feel like that's sort of how he's described in The Hobbit, because he's living in this like right. underground lake. I kind of like the design in theory. I think the art, the ana- someone was having a bad animation day when they drew yeah, it. Yeah, it's like in motion, a lot of this stuff doesn't work well, but the basic design I think is good. His voice is very interesting, because yeah. he's very lethargic and laid back. Yeah. He's, um, he's sort of depressed. They, don't, they also kind of use the word precious in an interesting way, because they have him refer to everything else as precious, but not the ring. Although I, I want to say that's how it is in the book, isn't it? Like he's, he, he doesn't just always refer to the ring as my precious in the Hobbit. I feel like no, but he does at he, least once or twice. Yeah, no, he definitely does once or twice. But I do feel like yeah. he kind of refers to himself as precious also. Yes, he does. Yeah, and that's what he does in this movie all the time. Yeah. So Bill just found the ring very nonchalantly. Yeah, they didn't make anything out of it here. A tasty monster. It would make us. <laughs> Is it my precious? God, this, I love this version of Gollum. He's cool. Yeah, he just he doesn't he doesn't really give a fuck. Yeah, no, it's just which makes for a very low energy scene all around because Bilbo doesn't really give a fuck. Yeah, it's like they're both just sort of laid back. Yeah, they they'd be good friends, I think. Yeah, if if you know, Gollum didn't ring. want to eat him. Yeah. yeah. There's that. <laughs> I've always, I've always thought it was too bad that you know, Bilbo did not, for his end of the bargain, say, you know, fuck it, I want to eat you. I yeah, no, this is like, <laughs> uh, yeah, this really is unfair. It's like if I win, I get to eat you. If you win, I'll show you how to get out of the cave. It's like, no, man, I want to eat some fish. And yeah, you look like a goddamn fish to me. I can make a fire. I got a sword. I can yeah. cut you up. You look pretty goddamn tasty, Gollum. <laughs> This is just an example for the animation for him, like when he's hunched over, it's sort of like there's too many lines. I think yeah. that's the issue of the animation in a lot of this movie. It's over lineated, if you wanna say. Sure. It's it's I think they try to make the characters too detailed and that makes them look odd in motion. Yeah. But I agree, I think Gollum it's an interesting design and I like sort of the motions he makes. There's yeah. very sort of he's sort of thoughtful when he moves. Yeah. And they do interesting stuff with his eyes. Yeah, he's got these big, like, sort of blind, fishy looking eyes. And we'll see more with those eyes. As yeah, they do some weird shit with his eyes. I've heard these riddles a lot in the last couple of days from reading the book and seeing the Peter Jackson movie. Yeah. And I really like the way this guy says the riddles. I don't know, these, like... It's, it sounds really threatening, the way he says, says those riddles. He doesn't do it rhythmically at all. Yeah, no, he doesn't. It's just like, it feels like he's going to, and then he doesn't. He just, like, pushes through it. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> When? When is the answer? Oh. Bilbo's really chipper through all this. Yeah, no. This, this is where Bilbo stops giving a fuck. Yeah. Where he's 
Yeah. Bilbo's just, I think, I feel like Bilbo's high through most of this movie. There's something about, like, his eyes where they kind of, like, droop a little bit that makes him look high to me. Well, he, he does have pipe weed with him. That's, that's true. Yeah. He was smoking pipe weed at the beginning of the movie. I mean, you know, I hate to make a marijuana joke, but that's, if you read, like, Tolkien's description of what pipe weed is, yeah, it's no, pretty much marijuana. Yeah, no, it's marijuana it's or tobacco, it's like... There's a lot of different types of pipe weed. Right, but it's cultivated in a way that like is very different than like tobacco on Earth. It's more like it is more of a sort yeah. of art for them. Mm-hmm. So now because they don't want to animate all the riddles, they have this really weird song, and then we just kind of pan around the cave. Which is fine, because the cave looks a lot better than their animation, so it's sort, of, it's sort of a blessing. It is. Instead of them just being like, you know, we can't really animate this well, but let's try to animate it anyway. It's like, fuck it, we've got these really cool cave drawings, let's do those. I do like the cave drawings. Yes. We saw some bones a couple minutes ago that were... Cool. I wonder how many people Gollum has eaten. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, I wonder if this has happened before. Like, someone fell down. I feel like he said in the book that he eats goblins sometimes when he can get them, but he doesn't he like does. how they taste. Right. So. That's why he's excited to meet Bilbo. <laughs> goblins must be really shitty at riddles. They, they must be. <laughs> Do you think he gives the goblins a chance for the riddles? I think so, yeah. I mean, where else does Gollum learn all these goddamn riddles? He just picks them up from all the people he eats. Very true. Let's just make a... That would be a really interesting movie if they just, like, made a serial killer movie kind of based off this idea. A serial killer who, like, gets people in riddle contests. <laughs> and then he and eats them. Yeah, and then he just keeps... And the reason why he never loses is because he keeps on learning new riddles from all the people he beats. So he, by the like... After he's killed like ten people, he's just got like a thousand really good riddles. I think we've got to write this movie. Yeah. What would yeah. it be called? Riddle Master. Nice. Or Riddle Me This. It's Riddle Me This. That's what I'm going to call it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Riddle Me This. I just realized I basically just described a, rid- a Riddler movie. Yeah. But, yeah, there we go. It'd be a little darker if the Riddler and Batman wanted to eat people. But there's just eyes going fucking yeah. nuts. <laughs> I love they like start to fluctuate right there. Yeah. Yeah. I like Gollum's, like, two, like, teeth. He's just got two teeth. Pretty much. Yeah. Bilbo's <laughs> <laughs> just strokes it off. Yeah. Yeah, time! Whatever. I totally knew it. Okay, so Bilbo's gonna ask him, what have I got in my pocket? And I love how, in the book it's depicted as Bilbo says it on accident. He's just thinking out loud to himself, yeah. and Gollum picks it up. But here it's very deliberate. Like, Bilbo sees it, and then he gets this, like, devilish gleam in his eyes. Yeah. What have I got in my pocket? There we go. <laughs> yeah, what have I got in my pocket? It's like... it. I mean, it, it always does, even in the book version, it just comes across as Bilbo's cheating because he does push it after yeah. Gollum's like, I can't do that. And he's like, no, what have I got in my pocket? But... I don't know. There's, there's something about this where he's like, fuck it, what have I got in my pocket? Yep. You can't really blame him. He's going to be eaten. Yeah. Which probably isn't fun. And I love that Gollum wants to show him his ring. Yeah, because it's like in the book, he's going to use the ring because he can't figure out the riddle, so he's going to use it to tell him kill Bilbo, right? Yeah. If I remember that correctly. Probably. Yeah. And in this, it's just kind of like, fuck it, I don't know. I mean, this is a nice guy. I want to show him my ring. Yeah, show and tell. Hey, yeah. Where are you going? Ah, oh, the little boat. Yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it is kind of creepy just how slow he talks. Yeah, there's something really methodical about the way he talks. Yeah. I like that the patch of hair he's got between his head and neck. It's, it's like the exact same color as him, so yeah. it's like, you're not sure if it's like hair or, or like... extra skin. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's really kind of gross. I like I love this part where he's just throwing random crap out of his cave. Well, what do you think Gollum does on a normal day? He sits around talking to himself. That's, that seems to be Pretty it. Pretty much it. Eating fish. I love, they say bless my soul in this movie all the time. Yeah, it's a very... Sort of it's a upper. weird expression. It is. Yeah. Bless my soul. <laughs> the precious is lost. He is. He, he even when he's angry, it's it's an interesting voice effect he's doing. Yeah. 
But no, the more I look at this version of Gollum, the more I, I think it's an interesting design, and I yeah. like it. There's definitely something intimidating about it. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because this movie is not, you know, connected to any other version of Lord of the Rings or anything, so it's yeah. you don't really get the sense of significance from all this. Yeah. But it's still interesting how much of an impression the Gollum, their Gollum leaves. So. Yeah, I mean, they definitely... This is where the movie sort of slows down and, like, they just basically do the whole scene. They don't do all yeah. the riddles, but they... Right. This all right, is, so he puts the ring on for the first time, and he's transparent. Yeah, I mean, they... I think I love this. Like Sting's visible. Dude, right. Who knows why Sting? This whole sword is visible, but whatever. That's how the visibility rings work. But when he puts it in the magic sheath, yeah, that, that he just has in his coat somewhere that he's yes. always had in there because <laughs> they didn't pick up a sheath at the troll dump. Yeah. The one thing I love about the ring is every time he puts it on and takes it off, there's like this Star Trek sound effects, like whoop, whoop. All right. So after <laughs> there's a great moment coming up here. Yeah. That we'll have to quiet up for, but first Gollum's going to have his internal debate. Where he makes a really weird logic jump. <laughs> yeah. He goes from, it's like, okay, he knew the way in, he knows the way out, I'll go wait for him. Yeah, even though he told me he was lost and got in this riddle competition so I would tell him the way out, he obviously knows the way out. <laughs> well, he's just monologuing to yeah. himself. Oh, that's what Gollum does. Yeah, that's, that's Gollum. All right, yes. here we go. Here we go. Listen to this, guys. How convenient! <laughs> How convenient! And he takes the ring off to tell everyone. Yeah, I mean, there's just something. There's something weird about characters pointing out how, like, sort of vaguely contrived the situation is that would allow him to get out. It's like that. Ah, How convenient! And here they, they do the thing where he leaps over Gollum yeah. in the most cartoonish way. <laughs> Ta ta! I, I, I kind of wish that this Gollum would call him a burglar just so I could hear the word burglar in that Gollum voice. Oh, that's too bad that didn't happen. I want to get a time machine and make the. Crazy them. eyes. <laughs> you see, like, that whole sequence was like just one commercial section. That's, that's interesting. It's like. Yeah. Commercial break into and commercial break out. They definitely knew how awesome that scene is. Yep. We had to find our way from the Goblin God. How is it? And he's back with the dwarves. Oh, well, the art of burglary. <laughs> really, you know the art. All right, so Gandalf is about to do something very funny. Yeah. He's going to start making puns. Oh, God. Your story, the Lord, has no way to prove it. It's true. I love, that's like the first of many really creepy winks that Gandalf gives him. But there's something about how they animate the wink. It's like it's like a brief, it's like one frame. But one of his eyes closes and then it's opened really quickly. It's so creepy. Well, Bilbo, it seems your story has come full circle. Yep, it's a circle. It's a big, big circle made of gold that you would wear. Maybe on your finger. Like a ring that you would find in a cave. That's magic. Like a ring, a magic ring that makes you invisible, Bilbo. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I just I don't ever I don't ever feel like they have a consistent handle on how they even want to do Gandalf in this movie. Yeah, I know. They, get, they have the strangest characterization of Gandalf. I am with you. It doesn't make sense how they do it. Alright, so this is a really interesting place to have a song. Yeah. That they do the out of the frying pan into the fire scene with the wargs. But they're all they're just cheery while they're coming to kill all these people. Fifteen birds in five for trees. Which to be fair, that song is in the book, so yeah. But <laughs> I love Gandalf's like EMP pine cone that he throws at them like <laughs> shoots out lightning bolts. I also like how the goblins are these really bizarre looking creatures, and then the wolves are just like normal, normal sized wolves with like these big hulking fat goblins on them. It's like, just makes me feel bad for the wolves. Their backs must be really sore. <laughs> yeah, I do love how angry all the goblins is, are, but the uh, song is really upbeat and happy. Yeah. It's an odd tone. Yeah. But here come the eagles. I don't know if these are also just sort of generic cartoon eagles. Yeah. They're not like big or sort of anthropomorphized or anything. They're just... Yeah, they look like basically just normal, like normal but larger eagles. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of scale issues in these movies. 
things, but yeah. Now here's a weird part: is that so they get picked up by the Eagles, and Bilbo's worried that they're going to kill them. What reason does he have to think these Eagles are like he, they would have been flying for hours now? I think that would have yeah. been addressed. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and he's why would the Eagles drop him? Yeah, to, like there's there's no reason for them to drop him. They just, the Eagles like fucking with people. Like, ooh, look, people in trouble. Let's yeah. pick them up and drop them. Yeah, <laughs> they won't see it coming. Yeah, fucking dwarves. Backwood forest. forest. <laughs> Are they gonna dash against those rocks? And there's like these like three like little normal sized rocks right there. All right, travelers, you may go. We will keep one of you as a prize. You look succulent. Then I love this. That's like Gwaiir, the Wind Lord. I don't know. There's something weird about birds talking to me. There's like they try to make the beak move, like it's making sounds. It's like it's a beak. It, it doesn't look it, right. It, you know, beaks don't have a lot of like muscles in them to articulate sounds like that. It's just a weird looking. It's kind of like in Mass Effect when Turians talk. It's just like there's nothing. You could you can't make those noises with that mouth. Or the or um, elites in yeah, Halo. Yeah, elites in Halo that have like the big mandibles. It's like yeah, you could you could make those noises? No. Terrible place if I remember. Like that's such a weird thing to say. Like, yeah. eh, but you know, I could be wrong. It could yeah. be all sunshine and lollipops. Yeah, it's only called Mirkwood. Sounds like a great place to vacation. This is as good as place as any to say that. Why does Gandalf has a have a dildo for a nose? I don't know. Like all like the noses on everyone other than Bilbo look really strange. Yeah, they're all really oversized and exaggerated. I think some of the dwarves must have cancer in their noses. Like yeah. that's just that's why all of them die at the end of the movie. Yeah, they succumb to tumors. But Bilbo's just got a normal sort of, like, spherical nose, that's it. Pretty much. So. The burglar. So now Gandalf is going to give him a very odd request. <laughs> yeah. First he's going to, you know, do the more... Yeah, the wink, the wink again. The wink, yeah. The creepy fucking wink. He's, I think he wants to have sex with Bilbo. It does kind of come across like that in a few scenes. It's really weird. Like, Gandalf is a little bit too interested. <laughs> Bilbo just looks into the camera and smiles. <laughs> Alright, so this is great. He says, to keep a... To keep a log. So he can study it and tell them what they did wrong. Like, what? Yeah. That's yeah, such a weird... weird... It's a bizarre request. It's like, so when you do this again... You know, you'll be more informed. I'll point out yeah. the mistakes you made along the way fighting the wood he's, elves and the It's like fighters. he's a teacher who's like, he's going to be like, I'm okay, I'm going to have a substitute today, but I want you to keep a log of what you guys do so I still know yeah. in, in case you do anything wrong. Do, do you think Kendall does that with all the, like, hobbits he throws in the quests? Yeah. Like, he, he grades them against each other. He has a top ten list. He should have given one to Frodo and Sam. Yeah. Is, like, just keep a log so that way after all this shit's done. I'll be able to give you some pointers, like point out yeah. like what you did wrong. Next all right, time, all right. So Sam, quest. it was it was probably dumb of you to trust to let Gandal to let Gollum be around as much as you did. I know Frodo wasn't you know he wasn't in no yeah. fit state to throw him away, but you know you, you should have done something about that. Yeah. So now it's another place where the song is really happy. It's basically the early version of Roads Go Ever On. Yeah. But they're going through a really scary Mirkwood. Yeah, they make Mirkwood a very terrifying looking place, but it's like, Road goes ever, ever on. Terrible. Very odd. Yeah. And so they, basically the whole thing with the log was just an excuse so Bilbo can narrate this part. Yeah. Because um, they didn't pay the narrator that much. I, I they pay him by the line. <laughs> Oh, they, they get through. It's sort of funny. This plays like the bullet version, like bullet point version of yeah. Mirkwood, where kind of everything that happens in the book kind of happens, but it's just kind of, they go they kind of yeah they go through, through it. it really really fast. I do like I like this part of the movie where he comes up over the top of Mirkwood. It's all like really fucking nice looking. They've got yeah, well, that's basically the exactly how it's yeah. described in the book. Is it's the first nice thing he's seen in forever. Yeah. So, sort of these weird killer butterflies. Yeah, it's just like everywhere. They have this nice little. There are moments which change a person for all time. 
Like when Gandalf winks at you. You never feel clean again. It changes the core of you. <laughs> it's really weird, like, you know, having just recently been playing Far Cry 3. That line of uh, him not going, wanting to go back, like, there's almost that exact line in Far Cry 3 in a part I, like, just played. It's just weird thematic connection. I don't know. It's, Far Cry 3 is very different from The Hobbit, but... Really? Yeah. yeah I have no, no idea. Well, unless <laughs> Bilbo pulls out a fr- flamethrower right here and torches the spiders. <laughs> they, they, there might be more similarities than I expected. The spider designs are really funny because they have, like, beards. They're, like, they're basically, like, old, crazy men. Yeah, they've spiders. got beards and they have, like, human-style mouths with big teeth. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, their spider designs don't look like spiders. And when they kill a spider, it goes into kaleidoscope vision. Yeah, like, it feels like for somebody it's supposed to be, like, from, like, a spider's eye point of view... But that doesn't make any sense because it no. shows the spider spinning. I don't know. Well, being killed gives you third-person vision. Yeah, exactly. It's, then the respawn counter pops up. Pretty much. That is a weird... <laughs> that's a weird line. Yeah. That's like one of those metaphors you see on like Facebook posts where like people make fun of other metaphors where it's like, yeah. it was as black as something that's black. Yeah, it's as black as a patch of midnight that never been cleared away. Well, the noses all stick through the, the webbing. And this was when the spiders started raping the dwarves. Yeah, there's something really creepy about this part where, like, the way the way whatever dwarf that was was just shouting out, go away, is really... I'm weird. sorry to say, Gandalf, I sit there and I watched it. I watched it all. Thirteen dwarves, thirteen rapes, and I did nothing. Yeah. It will haunt me to the end of my days. Dark section of the movie. And then he defeats the spiders really fucking easy. Yeah, just chucks a rock. Kaleidoscope vision. Yep. And they cut the dwarves out, and... Well, the dwarves are high. Yep. As they probably should be. Yep. Because Bilbo's being heroic here, but there's something about it. His voice still makes it sound like he doesn't care that much. Like, he's kind of interested, but he's like, you must follow me. This, like, yeah. okay. And it's, it's interesting how they do this part now, where basically they simplify the whole Mirkwood section, so it, they just wind up running into the elves Yeah. in a minute here. But first, Bilbo's got to fight them. Yes. And I actually kind of like how they dramatize this here, where it's weird that Sting doesn't turn invisible, but it is kind of funny that all the spiders can see a Sting. Yeah, and it's just like this floating sword that's like, shouting at them. Something weird about... It. I've always thought it was weird in The Hobbit how the spiders talk. I don't know. That's, yeah. I don't think can think of any other like fantasy fiction where spiders talk. I don't think they talk in the book. I th- No, I'm pretty sure they do talk in the book. Okay. Not, they're not like... Really verbose, but I do recall that. Yeah. Pretty much all the animals talk in The Hobbit at some point or another. Yeah. Even, even the thrush. Yes. Here, Bilbo casts his lightning spell somehow. I don't know. He got enough XP. Yeah. This is a very he interesting, up. dramatized effect of how he's attacking the spiders. And now we're back to normal. Yep. It's magic sheath that sort of... I like all the faces on the trees. That's kind of an interesting... It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz, where some of the trees yeah. just look evil. Yeah. It's like, they don't really do anything with the faces, but it's just like, some of the trees look like they have creepy faces. So why the fuck do the wood elves look like this? I don't know. This is this is one of those dis- like character designs that don't make any sense to me. Where like they've got the really long legs, but really short torsos. And, and like, they're blue with the, blonde hair. The funny hats. Yeah, they look more like gnomes. Yeah, they look like really weird gnomes. Would have been great if they had done Lord of the Rings in the style and have Legolas look like that. That would have been, been wonderful. Because Legolas would be one of these guys. Yeah, yeah. Legolas is the Prince of Mirkwood. So, there's a, there's a creepy thought for you. They like pictured the Lord of the Rings movies, but with Legolas looking like a giant legged blue gnome person. Orlando Bloom in motion capture. Yeah. 
This is really weird. They have Thranduil, the Elven King here, but he's got like this weird Russianish accent. Yeah. I don't know the motivation behind. I don't think any of the other elves talk, so I don't know if all the Wood Elves have Russian accents or if it's just particularly the King does. Well, it's because you know it's a representation of you know communism because the elves at the end of the story want to spread the wealth, take the gold, spread it evenly around everyone. And uh, so they got to be Russian. They're fucking commie red bastards. That makes so much more sense now. I know. I, I hope Peter Jackson puts that subtext into his it's, version of the story. Is. That'd, be, that'd be great. Yeah. It is funny that they do, however, keep this part true to the book where it takes him weeks to figure all this out. Yeah. He's there for a long time. Human men. I do like how they, they make that detail. They're human men. Not <laughs> All the elves just get fucking drunk. Yeah. There's something I don't know, there's something vaguely racist about how he says that where it's like the wood elves like their wine. I yeah. don't know. I feel like if you said that about like an actual like race like the Italians love their wine, it still it sounds kinda of racist, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bilbo, you know, he's a simple fellow from a simple place. Those Frenchies love their wine, you know. <laughs> Those fucking frogs and their yeah. wine. All right, we've, we've had enough racial talk. <laughs> oh God, this is this has to be similar to like waterboarding, right? Yeah, no, I can't imagine that because because those barrels had already been opened and the wine drained out, so it's like I get the feeling that those would not be completely airtight. And no. some of that water would be getting in there. Well, in the book, they describe how each of the dwarves is just, like, beat to shit when they get on the land. Because yeah. they get battered around, and they're waterlogged, and they can barely breathe. And they all hate Bilbo for a couple days. Yeah. As well, they should. Colony of humans. Colony of humans. It is kind of funny how much they want you to understand. All right, these are the men. Yeah, these, these are human humans. Yeah. They're not... Hobbit humans are dwarf humans. Tolkien always did sort of a good job. It's just like the met race of men, race of elves. Yeah. It's very simplified. But here's the Lonely Mountain. It's pretty simple. I love here how Thorin makes his big entrance and then passes out. I do love how return. they always they always refer to him as King Under the Mountain. Yeah, they don't say Thrain. Yeah, no, they just it is not even the King Under the Mountain. It's just like I am grandson of King Under the Mountain. It's maybe the guy just changed his name to that. Yeah, like official name change. Hail, Thorin Oakenfield! I am part of the <laughs> I love Bard's mustache. Yeah, Fuck off mustache. Yeah. It's too bad they couldn't get Tom Selleck to play him in the Hobbit movie. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of odd they call him Bard the Garman. Guardman. He's always been known as Bard the Bowman in yeah. the book. They never say that. It's too bad. Okay. It's always felt like kind of a contrivance in the book, though, that they call him Bowman instead of Archer. What the fuck? Who would call someone a bowman? <laughs> I know. Because you use well, his a name's bow. Bard, you know. Yeah, so it's like, of course his name has to run. And chances were, it would be a very horrible and indeed. Bill was a little bit louder at this yeah. point. Yeah. The There's the waterfall effect. That's so weird. It's such a, it's such a terrible effect. That smell. I've not smelled a dragon before. That's a really contrived line reading. He just kind of says, I've never smelled dragon, dragon before. <laughs> strange. Very strange. There's a lot of strange things here. So we're already to the dragon. Yep, this, this is movie fucking books, man. Oh, yeah. This, this would be late in movie two for Peter Jackson, I think. Yeah. So he's Captain's finished. log, star date, 2746. I have made it to the top of the mountain. Found a thrash. Thrush. Thrush. So is this thrush supposed to be really fucking special? Um, if there's a, I mean, there's a thrush in the book that's special. I mean, obviously the thrush is important because he really... Yeah, the thrush the is important, but like, I'm wondering if the thrush itself... Like, I never feel like that's addressed. Does right. the thrush know about the prophecy? Is that like his job? Is that like every time he's just like goes there and knocks a few times on that stone just in case there's someone nearby. I don't know. Maybe like that's like his father did that and his father's father and it was passed yeah. down to him like son. 
today will you will learn to make noise on a rock. Yeah, that's just what I'm curious about, is whether or not it's just like a total coincidence. It's just some sort of weird, vague magic that always causes a thrust to be there when the keyhole shines. Do you like how the door just opened on its own? Yeah, and there's something... I love how the keyhole is just like this really cliched, normal-looking keyhole. Yeah. In like this stone door. It looks really weird. I, and that's something I wonder how Peter Jackson's going to handle. Yeah, it's, it's what, like it's cinematic. What this, yeah, what, what that is going to look like. Yeah. You can't just have this like weird uh, hotel keyhole no. in the side of this rock. They could. It'd be weird. Yeah. I've already gotten you out of two messes. Not Bilbo has a good point here. He's making. Yeah, so I just like you, you assholes. I've been doing everything in this goddamn movie. <laughs> now you want me to go to the Dragon's Lair by myself? Fine, I'll go play Dragon's Lair. I play the game all the time at <laughs> the arcade. Burgle something. Burgle something. Oh, that's such a great term. Yeah, burgle. I'm yeah. gonna go burgle, guys. You can't ever, like, hold that against someone. Like, yeah. if you came home and all your stuff was gone and a guy was there taking, like, your last ounce of food or something. You're like, what are you doing? I'm burgling you. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead. You want to get a drink later? Yeah. <laughs> you're in I love how they, they draw the tunnel, which is that there is nothing. Yeah. It's it's just just black. in blackness now. Yes. Then Bilbo has this long internal debate, which is like, it's one of the longest things that happens in the movie of whether he's going to go in or not. Yeah. And I think it's funny, because they don't usually draw... I love this shot. This shot looks like he's about to, like, go to his execution. <laughs> yes. He's, like, walking stoically towards the entrance of the cave. That would make for a very different movie. Yep. Not quite as child-appropriate. I also love with Bilbo, he's got, like, that belt and belt buckle that's, like, up, like, right under his chest. Yeah. What is it there for? I don't know. He's got really tall pants. Well, he's a little fellow. Maybe it's different for them. Whatever happens afterwards is nothing. I actually disagree with that. Yeah, I completely disagree with that. <laughs> if you had to fucking... It's like the dragon started breathing flame at you and you stood there and took it. Yeah, it's braver. It's, yeah. Back, if all you know, the dragon might not even be in there. He could have, like, died. Yeah, nobody's seen the dragon for years. He could have had a hernia, his back's broken, he can't move. Maybe the dragon is actually a really nice guy. I mean, yeah. all the dwarves in this movie kind of come across as assholes. That would be a really, like, pheno- like fascinating twist. If he gets yeah. in there and Smaug turns out, like, they killed all of his children and he was doing this all in retaliation yeah. and he's keeping the gold safe. Bilbo has, like, a moral dilemma. But here we come across Smaug the Great. Like, like Bilbo goes for a cup. Yeah, he, he picks up this lame little, like, clay goblet. Because it's funny, is in the book, that's what he does, is he picks up a goblet, but it's supposed to be like a really majestic yeah, one. Yeah, like, the way they describe it sounds like it's this the most spectacular goblet you've ever seen. This is just, like, lame. Yeah, it's like, oh, I could totally, like, go to a lake and fill this. Yeah. He chose. So what do you think poorly. of... <laughs> what do you think of Smaug's design? I, I really like it. I think... It's really interesting to me. Like, it's a different kind of dragon design. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's got the basic elements of a sort of Western dragon with like the long body and the four legs and the wings, like the kind of bat wings, and the long neck and tail. But there's something really sort of almost like feline about it. He's got sort of cat eyes and he's got a lot of hair. Yep, he's got whiskers. And I like his tail. I like his tail ends in like these three fleshy prongs. Something, I don't know, I really like the smoke design. It's good. Yeah, it's it's got this unique quality to it that I really like. That's one of the things I'm really interested about for the Jackson films, is what their design of smoke is going to be like. Yeah, it's interesting thing to think about. Yeah, because they, it's very easy to just make a really cliche dragon, but I hope they decide not to go yeah. down that route. They've always had good designs for all the creatures, so it'll be yeah. interesting. The weird thing is that they've said that Benedict Cumberbatch, who's voicing Smaug, is going to be doing the motion capture. How do you motion capture a dragon? I don't know, but... Yeah. Yeah, no, I have, I have no idea. I, I saw that, too. It's like, well, okay. I want to see those motion capture sessions. Yes. Like, I want to... Does he, like, hold his arms out and flap them? Yeah. All right, so here's where Bilbo just starts fucking with Smaug. He's yeah, like, I'm gonna start bragging, and uh, I'm gonna give myself all these really ridiculous titles. Like Dovahkiin, the Dragonborn. Yes. <laughs> luck wearer. Yeah. What does that mean? 
He wears luck. Interesting. What does luck do when you wear it? I don't know. You have to find out for yourself. Is it comfortable? Yes, it's very comfortable. Is it made from the hide of animals? No, it's not made from the hide of animals. Good. Peter approves. Short town shall pay dearly for this intrusion. I think the picture is acid drool. Yeah. Well, the V breathes fire. Oh, that makes sense, I guess. Wait, you don't know everything. I told the woman who brought me to this. Be done with your riddles. What have I got in my pocket? Yes, <laughs> what have I got in my dragon pocket? <laughs> Revenge. Revenge. This is the perfect cave for revenge. Revenge. Also, I really like Smaug's ears. Like, there's these big yeah. marsupial ears. I realize that the invisibility on the ring in this movie is basically like active camouflage in Halo. Yeah. Where it works if you stand still, but if you move a little bit, you become transparent. Yeah. Maybe he'll get Sprint next. <laughs> Bilbo with a jetpack. Ah, oh, that'd be great. I want to see that in the live-action movies. <laughs> also, really, I like how they make Smaug really fat. Yeah. So, because... He's just been sitting yeah, on his gold. Yeah, he's just been for... sitting in his gold like he's this really greedy, fat dragon. But he's still... It's kind of like the kingpin in Spider-Man. It's like he's really fat, but he's really strong. <laughs> That's an interesting comparison to make. That's, That's exactly what he's like. He's got like. bat wings. But yeah, That's... dragons tend to have bat wings. Yeah. And I don't know why they do. Messing up all his gold here. I don't know why he'd do that. He's got enough of it. Go around. Now he's burning all his stuff. The, the, kinda, the flame effect is kind of weak on his fire breath. It is. Yeah. There's, there's times where I do have to wonder what, how much did they actually have to spend on this movie? Because there are moments where it's like, oh, they, it looks like they put some time into that. Yeah. And then there are moments where it's like, oh my god, one of their kids drew it on a napkin, yeah. didn't they? That's one of those yeah. on a napkin moments. This scene goes on pretty long. Yeah, this is like this scene and the Gollum scene are like the two scenes that like we're just going to just do the scene from the book, basically. I mean, we're going to change. They're, they're good scenes. So yeah, no, they're, they're the argue. best scenes in the movie. Yeah, um, they're the best scenes in the book too. Yep. I like this part too. I just like how proud Smaug sounds. Yep. About his belly. Look at my abs. I've been working all week. <laughs> I love this. I love how it, like, where it zooms in and then it's like, it's super up close and it's like one scale is missing. It's like, you have to have some really good eyesight. The way you kind of imagine it not being like one scale is sort of like this whole like section right. that's, you know, small enough not to be noticed by Smaug but big enough that you could see it so you could shoot it with an arrow. Yes. Not like this one tiny slit. Well, it's also described as literal armor in the book. Yeah. And in, in this, I think he says it's armor, but it doesn't really look like it. Yeah. It just looks like he's missing a scale, and I guess that just goes right into his nervous system or something. Yeah, that's one arrow right up there. Just Yeah. It's convenient that he's missing a scale right by his Achilles heel, basically. Yes. That's one of those things where in the Hobbit movies... Uh, by Peter Jackson, I think they're gonna have to do a little more, make that a little more cinematic than just yeah, his like spot. It's like somehow like that arrow should be like the last blow, yeah, or else or else it'll come across like the uh, Troy Troy movie with the Achilles heel, where it's right. like, well, that's Stupid. really that's really lame, pretty much. Yeah. To do the, they should have done the thing in the Troy movie. It's kind of just getting off topic, but when he gets shot in the Achilles heel and it's like Achilles' blood just all drains out of the heel, that's how it's supposed to happen in the story. They should have done that, and just like make it really gruesome. <laughs> okay, I was looking at you for a second, Sean. Then I looked back, and Bilbo's bent over, and Thorin is right behind him, and I was like, "What the fuck are we watching?" He's extinguishing him. Yes. <laughs> Extinguish me. Bilbo and Thorin love their extinguishing. Yep. Alright, time for some action. Yeah, let's get it on. Fire! 
Cut the commercial. commercial oh, that would be that would be frustrating. Yeah. If it's we like, were watching. Right this. when shit's going down, commercial break. It's an odd thing that that is getting off track, but the whole idea of commercial breaks is odd to me because you need them for the first airing of something and then never yeah. again. Mm-hmm. So it's like Especially because I think we're moving away from that as an idea, as a model. Yeah. Um, so one day there's, like, kids who are going to watch The Hobbit and be like, why the fuck does the movie stop every time? Yeah, it, I mean, it already feels really jarring to me because yeah. they, they are really commercial breaks. Like, they're, yeah. you know, you can watch TV shows without the commercial breaks and you can spot where they are, but they're not really intrusive like they are here. Right. Because they even do the thing where when they come back from commercial, they have a little recap. Yeah, and like the, 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 the song like that they were playing at the very end starts again when yeah. the commercial comes back up, so it feels really sort of, sort of startling. So here's an interesting part where the thrush, they make it much more literal where he actually gives the thrush instructions and the thrush flies away to do them. Yep. They, the, the best thing is when the thrush talks to Bard and he's like, what? What? Bilbo told you something? What? Bilbo's down a well? Okay. <laughs> like, you don't hear the thrush saying anything. Yeah. So there's Tom Selleck. Yep, and his friend Longface. <laughs> the dragon is coming. Oh, I'm a fool. Cut the bridge in. To arms! To arms! It's a pretty laid back war scene. I mean, he's shouting a little, but. Yeah. I feel like he would shit his pants first. <laughs> yeah, when he saw a dragon. The dragon is coming. This is much more gruesome in the book, too, because there's a whole long battle, and Smaug winds up destroying Lake Town entirely. Yeah. I mean, he kind of does in this, you just don't, it just doesn't focus on it. Yeah. Ready? Arrow! Arrow! Yeah, like he says, arrow, not fire. Or volley. Or, yeah, or bowman! Yeah. Bowman! Bow! Yeah. <laughs> so maybe it is a lot more like Far Cry 3 than I thought. I've totally done this in Far Cry 3. <laughs> Set an entire village on fire. Here's the thrush, the heroic thrush. <laughs> away, you fool bird! <laughs> you fool bird! <laughs> I'm gonna say that when I see birds in public now. <laughs> away, you fool bird! <laughs> you found one? <laughs> this is like, I'll use my microscope vision. There it is. <laughs> it's like how he spends he wastes the time talking to his arrow yeah his it, I love when he says he says black arrow and it just makes me think of like this African American version of green arrow green arrow from the DC comics <laughs> I am black arrow alright you hit a self destruct switch yep and there you can see like okay it didn't yeah, destroy it the Dale Town was like just sinking into the river ah the shitty waterfall the best waterfall ever. We meet again. The dwarves strike me as much greedier in this version. Yeah. As we're about to see, they're just playing with their gold. They're so happy. They just want to ship it up and bring it home. And, and Bill was like, eh, whatever. Because, it's weird, because the key to their mission in the book is not necessarily getting a bunch of gold. I mean, that's yeah. good. They want to reclaim their homeland. Mm-hmm. But here it's just, they're basically pirates. Yeah. <laughs> they do kind of come across like that. We must catalog our wealth. We must catalog our wealth. He sounds like Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> yep. We must catalog our wealth. Will you stop calling me burglar? <laughs> so they've just been playing with their gold for a week. Yeah, I like that. We must find our way out of this mountain and see for ourselves if he's gone. And quickly, according to this map, the main gate lies in this direction. Follow me. What have they been eating for a week if they've been trapped in this room? Gold? Ah, yes. Dragon droppings? <laughs> it's been, there's been really dark moments. Yeah. Populated by giant fireflies. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes me picture a giant firefly. That'd be cool. I've never seen that in the fantasy movie. Fight, fight giant fireflies. Someone make that. Yeah. I like how all their enemies can just get in and yeah. talk to them. They're not very secure. I have slain him. The thrush delivered your message. 
Bart is very matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, he's just like he just says what's on his mind. Pretty much. I have slain the dragon. What do you think of that? <laughs> Bilbo really likes Bard, despite having never interacted with him before. Yeah. Couldn't have happened to a nicer chap. Really. Here's where we find out Bilbo's a filthy socialist. Yeah. That's the one that's just, just plenty for all. <laughs> that's, I love that Thorin says that. Oh, you say you did everything. Yeah, but that's a mere technicality. You will see in our contract that we we get all the gold. Ah, uh, yes. Basically, he's Chekhov. Conrad van Thranduil. Thranduil basically sounds like Chekhov from Star Trek. Yeah, no, that's what he sounds like. <laughs> how did Thranduil know that these guys were up here? Um, I mean, I don't even know how Barge stumbled upon them, but I'll accept that. It seemed like Thranduil, like, came up there with a purpose. <laughs> Alpha vision. Yeah. That's what his elf eyes saw. Here we have our epic battle scene. <laughs> I just can't take the wood elves seriously. No. The design is so silly. All right, here's here's where Thorin just becomes a total fucking idiot. Yeah, in this movie. King under the mountain. Confustigate and be bothered with victory. Because he says that in the book at the beginning about the dwarves, he says confustigate and be bothered these dwarves. Yeah, but they moved it here. Is that kind of funny? I like how they kind of hammer home that the dwarves did nothing in this movie. Yeah. Madness. 14 against 10,000? Yet we march off the circuit. Now, how do we figure they have 10,000 men out there? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think we saw it most like, what, 50 dots? Yeah, 10,000 men and five giant fireflies. <laughs> this is war. You don't understand it. War is all about being stupid, apparently. We just fight. Yep. I love, I love how the dwarven armor has like these pointy helmets. Yes. So they're really big fans of Link from Legend of Zelda, so they want to make helmet <laughs> versions of his hat. I wonder how much earlier was this than Legend of Zelda? Uh, probably like, yeah, like, this was probably like ten years earlier, yeah. maybe. That's a really awkward scene where he's like Dwalin is like bowing down to Thorin. Yeah. Like Thorin is so egotistical, he wants them all to bow down to him. But I love their but so Bilbo's like three armies. They really want you to like get yeah. this movie house how, how it's so crazy there could be multiple armies fighting at once. Yeah. How nuts is that? I like how all the men, like the human men, look like Disney boyfriends. Yeah. They're like the prince from Little Mermaid. <laughs> this like the best line of the whole movie. Kill the men, kill the elves, save the gold for ourselves. <laughs> it's like they're going on strike or something. <laughs> Yeah, get out of the way, old man. We are going to kill each other. <laughs> Gandalf? <gasps> Dildo knows. <laughs> I will speak with the kings. Dread has come upon you all. An army of goblins with claims of treasure. They, they really, they treat you pretty easily here. Yeah, they just straight up like, okay, yeah, no, goblins, let's, let's fight them. I like that, now they start talking about how they're friends. It's a really funny line that's about to come up. Great elf king, my truest friend and ally. Yeah, <laughs> my truest friend and ally. <laughs> Makes Thorin sound like a real pussy. Yeah. Your people are like brothers unto mine. We shall be comrades, my friend. We will fight together, and, and afterwards we will suck each other's dicks. This is this is who we are to each other. Yeah, they just like really quickly make this. Yeah. Brotherhood packed. And Bilbo's just like, yeah, fuck, fuck this shit. And he's like, I am done. And he just leaves. Here we go back to the rock and roll. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, oh my god. So the, the battle scene, I love this. Yeah, it's just like these dots and like lines. <laughs> the best part is when the eagles come. A battle of four armies. Yes, four. 
It's just not that hard to count to four, Bilbo. <laughs> I thought they all paused next to each other on the battlefield. Too. Yeah, it's like they're posing for an album cover or something. Yes. Three kings. <laughs> it's just like Gandalf just shows up. Wait, wait. There's some eagles. The Deus Ex Machina. Yes. Five armies now? Well, this is fucking ridiculous. Uh, so four armies I could take, but five? Whatever should we call this? Yeah. The best part is the dot scene for this, if you watch with the eagles. They're just like dots that go up and then drop other dots. It's great. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yep. uh, here. So you More see, dots just like clouds of the, dust. From the, yeah. dots at the dots at the top, there's just like dots falling out of them. <laughs> well, that was an epic, you know... Heart pounding battle. I was on the <laughs> edge of my seat, Jonathan. I know. I don't. I don't know how we got through it without having a you know heart palpitations. Yeah. You're hurt. I still live. And you, a slight crack on the head. How did people get the crack on the head? I don't know. They they like skip all that stuff. It, it makes it seem like how they edit this that Bill took on his ring and just started taking a nap while everyone was killing each other. <laughs> and then he gets up when Bomber crawls over to him. Like, I think that's. Are what you guys? I'm... Are you shitheads done yet? Yeah, I think that's what happened. And I think Bilbo just said that. Or maybe he was smoking some pipe weed and, like, fell off backwards. So. Yeah. <laughs> that's how he cracked his head. Yeah. Now, here they just noted that almost half the dwarves died. More than half. Seven yeah. of the six. With When you count Thorin. And in the book, it's only three. It's Thorin and Feely and Keeley. Yeah. So, this, this is a very dark movie. Yeah, they're just like, you know, three dwarves, that's not enough. Yeah. Thorin's pretty lucid for a dying man. Yeah. He's got a bad case of Gandalf beard. He does. <laughs> Thorin has this really... I, like, I love the character development in Thorin. It's just like, he has this really quick change of heart. Yeah. It's like, you're a coward. You are not a coward, my friend. Until <laughs> now. And somehow he figured out what the point of war is, which I don't really know what the message there is. Yeah. That when you're in a war, you die? I War, war never changes. <laughs> I like how Gandalf has his arm in a sling. It's just like, that's it. Yep. I would even think he hurt his arm. He just no, wanted to put it in a sling and make it look like he did something. <laughs> he just kept zipping around the battlefield, teleporting. Yeah, just saying convenient lines to people. Pretty much. Farewell. You were never nice to me. See, I love how sad Bilbo's face looks and just how nonchalant the line delivery is. Like, it's, yeah. it looks like he should be, like, you know, he's really affected by it and says, like, farewell, Thorin. Son of a bitch. Your share was greater. It's all my pony could carry, and it's more than I'll ever need. But you have other prizes. Gandalf still got his arm in that sling. So here's where they start really heavily foreshadowing the Lord of the Rings for some reason. Yeah, but I don't even think they ever had plans to go and like make up this version of Lord of the Rings because that would not have worked. No, we, so, we, we we have evidence of that. Yeah, we definitely do. Turn of the King movie by Rankin Bass. Oh, uh, yeah, that's something better not not talked about. Yes. Does it say they did a pretty good job of taking Tolkien songs and setting music to it for this movie? They did not do a very good job of making original music for Return of the King. Let's oh, okay. just say that. <laughs> I think I had to watch Return of the King once. It was like one of those days in elementary school where there was a snow outside, so we had to all go into the gym for recess. Yeah. And they could they only had shitty movies to show for that. Like, like the, Fern Gully. Or like the old Chronicles of Narnia. Like from, from like the BBC TV movies. Yeah. I saw those. They were they were awful. Yep. Not as good as this movie. No, this is a fun movie. It's an awesome movie. Especially especially for kids. Like it feels like they like this movie definitely has a lot of problems if you're watching it with you know, as an adult, but it's it understands how to pace a kids movie. I feel that only, that only yeah, kids would appreciate it. Yeah, just a kids TV movie. Yeah, of the Hobbit. Like this would be a good way to introduce a child to the Hobbit. Like yeah. you know, maybe if like you know they read the book, they like it. The Peter Jackson version is probably not you know good enough for like a seven year old. Mm-hmm. Probably a little too adult. Yeah. So show them this. Like how he's put the ring in like a special case. Yeah, on his, on his mental piece. All right, so that's the Hobbit. What you th- we well, we just said what we thought. It's yeah. fun. It's awesome. I love it. Well, 
Because, I mean, I do have a, a heck of a lot of nostalgia around this, but I, I still think it holds up as a very interesting piece of animation. It's yeah. got a very unique quality to it. And it's not a great movie or anything. Yeah, but it's, but it's got this really nice heart to it that's in... It like, does. it captures the spirit of the book, even though it changes a lot from the book in, like, kind of weird ways. It has that, like, feel to it that, you know, it, that's, that's what you're looking for, really. It really does. So, anything else to say before we sign off here, Sean? Nope, I think... That's that's the Hobbit, Tom sound effects by Tom Clack. It looks that's like a great. It, that's the best name for someone who does sound effects. <laughs> Tom Clack. It's great. It's like it, I, Tom Clack and Jimmy Bang. It does look like all the animators on this movie were Japanese. Which I it's think interesting because it's not doesn't seem. It seems more like Eastern European sort of style. Of it animation does to me than it does Japanese. But yeah, I assume they just outsourced everything. Yeah, I've, that tends to be how it works. Yeah. All right. So. We'll see you guys next week. We will talk about The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. Are you excited, Sean? Yes, I'm excited for a Hobbit terrible subtitle. Me too. 